Holy City Center Radio. It is episode 81, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Today is Tuesday, February 7th, 2023. I hope you all had a great weekend. Sorry for the slight delay on the episode. Got tied up with some other HCS work. Uh, Lots going on in Holy City Center land, um, and just decided to postpone it. I didn't want to rush it. Um, you know, especially poor Lindsay Collins, who uh, edits every episode and produces them. I didn't, you know, uh, didn't want to make it too difficult, uh, send something too late. I figured, hey, you know what? Don't push it. <clears throat> so I apologize, but we're here still planning on doing an episode on Wednesday as well. And of course, Friday. So you'll still get your three episodes this week. Just a slight delay in the first one. So with that, let's get into the news. All right. So I think the biggest news over the weekend uh, was this Chinese surveillance balloon or spy balloon, whatever you want to call it. Uh, You know, if you were paying attention to the news, you might have come across this, this, you know, the Chinese government was saying it was like a weather pattern surveillance balloon or something. U.S. was like, oh, we're pretty sure you're spying on us. Uh, there was this balloon that had entered U.S. U.S. airspace at one point uh, and was, you know, floating around the country um, and then eventually made its way east. So the uh, the talk about it, of course, one side was saying we should shoot this thing down immediately. Uh, this is ridiculous. They're spying on us. <clears throat> the other side was saying, well, actually, the U.S., when they discovered it, it was already over. Uh, you know, a, one of the states here didn't, you know, they didn't just see it over in an area where they could shoot it down because this thing is like as wide as three buses or something like that. <laughs> and so they didn't want to shoot it down and potentially harm people. And so it waited. Uh, the government waited until it finally had gone out past the Atlantic. So you're hearing, you know, before that, you're hearing all this debate and this whole hullabaloo. If you're into politics at all, you saw that. But uh, it became bigger news here in South Carolina um, on Saturday. As the balloon was making its way in the area, the FAA actually issued a, a ground stop for three airports in the Carolinas for what they said at the time was a national security effort. Of course, come to find out, it was this Chinese spy balloon. They were planning on shooting it down, and we're waiting for it to, uh, you know, cross into the ocean where they felt like it was safe, uh, and it, there was less chance that, or, or no chance that it would float and, you know, or crash somewhere and hurt somebody. So, but it was just weird seeing this alert. You know, imagine your plane getting delayed. We can all imagine that, of course. But, you know, who hasn't if you've flown in the last couple of years, especially, or your flight canceled? But imagine getting ready to go on vacation or work trip or you're trying to get home, whatever it may be, and your flight, you know, gets delayed for an uncertain amount of time because no flights can leave or land at the airport you're at due to the government may shoot down a Chinese spy balloon. <laughs> that is not something you would think your flight could possibly delay, be delayed for, but here we are. It happened. Uh, so uh, the airports that were affected, of course, were Charleston International over here in North Charleston, um, an airport in, in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, also grounded all flights. And the other one was the Myrtle Beach Airport. So for several hours, people in those airports, nothing was going on. They had to wait. Uh, So shortly after it was really starting to pick up steam on the news, uh, the government finally deemed it okay to shoot down. And uh, so (laughs) it's funny. There's some videos, including one I put on my Instagram. Uh, Somebody I follow let me use their video. People in Myrtle Beach were watching it and recording it with their phones and then cheering uh, when the, you know, the U.S. military shot the balloon down. And it's just this silly video that I kind of needed on Saturday. You know, this dumb story about the surveillance balloon. I say dumb just because uh, everything's politicized and, you know, who knows what's true. And people are making way bigger deals out of this. So uh, it was just fun to see people enjoying their Saturday out at like the beach or whatever, and (laughs) cheering on uh, US military shooting down a balloon. Uh, I think that was pretty great. Uh, So thankfully, it wasn't too, too much longer after that, that folks at the Charleston Airport and the others I mentioned were able to continue on with their plans. Again, just a bizarre day uh, incident and reason to have your flight delayed. Uh, So that was Saturday. It was fun to kind of follow along on Twitter. This is when these types of things are when Twitter is fun. 
and how it used to be when there was an event like this, whether it's something uh, like an award show, we just had the Grammys um, or, or something else. Uh, you know, it's just fun to see people's funny takes on things when there's something developing, you know, people's predictions and thoughts. And yeah, there's always going to be some dumb people out there who say terrible things or something idiotic. But for the most part, it was just fun seeing the memes and the jokes and, and people discussing this whole thing and, and, and not so much in a political manner, um, just as a, like, can you believe this is happening? You know, this is wild. Who would have thought, you know, that kind of conversation. So I did appreciate that. Uh, the balloon is being recovered as we speak. Uh, the government plans to look at it and see, you know, were the Chinese, um, was the Chinese government, <clears throat> excuse me, telling the truth? Uh, is this really just some kind of weather surveillance balloon or was it something more? And it'll be interesting to see what they find um, once they recover all that debris. Speaking of politics, we got a few political pieces of information. Um, the Democratic Party... Uh, this past Saturday, approved the reordering of its 2024 presidential primary, replacing Iowa with South Carolina in the leadoff spot as part of a major shakeup. Uh, the plan behind it, the party says, is to empower black and other minority voters critical to its base. Uh, they didn't have that diversity in Iowa, they felt. And uh, so they decided to move it to South Carolina um, and you know get a better idea of like the entire party's base, not just... Uh, you know, in a state like Iowa, South Carolina being more representative of the entire country and, and the, the base of the Democratic Party, according to them. So that's fun news for South Carolinians. You know, South Carolina was already deemed first in the South when it came to all the primaries because uh, right after Iowa. And so that was like the whole shtick here and you know, how they would try to get people excited that all these presidential candidates were coming into town and or into the state rather. Um, and it's always a big hullabaloo, you know, the, especially this most recent uh, run in 2020 when you had all these Democratic can you know, candidates. There was tons. So there's so many events throughout the state just nonstop leading up to the primaries. Uh, I mean, it was crazy. Uh, these are your opportunities to meet these politicians potentially or hear them speak in person, get an idea of who they are. And it's crazy to think that you can get so close and maybe even chit chat one on one with someone that ends up becoming the president. You know, that's what these events are like. You end up getting the kind of FaceTime you never would um, with a politician normally of their stature. And especially, you know, if they do go on to become president. So it'll be uh, interesting to see how crazy this uh, next batch of primaries will be. You know, depending on how many candidates are running, uh, obviously with the Democratic side of things, not expected. Uh, no one is expected to run against Joe Biden, but who knows, perhaps um, someone will enter the ring or maybe he won't run uh, for reelection. And so then we'll have some kind of primary. Uh, but regardless, the Republican side, they're still going to come to South Carolina for their, you know, for the state's primary as well. So we'll probably have lots of candidates visiting and doing events like that. We'll be sure to keep you posted. But it's going to stay wild in South Carolina in politics, as it always does, uh, you know, now that uh, they're going to be first in the nation for the Democratic primary. All right, moving on to the Murdoch trial. Of course, the third week of the trial began today. Um, there was uh, a few things that happened um, on Thursday and Friday that I'm going to recap as well um, as we look at the trial and, and what's going to be happening going forward. And, and, of course, I will also you know update on further episodes as everybody wants to know what is happening at the trial. What's the big drama this time around? So... Uh, uh, last week before the weekend, um, one of the, I don't know if most impressive perhaps, um, but also very sad, uh, was the son of the Murdoch's former housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield took the stand, uh, and detailed some different things, but most importantly that Alec Murdoch took $4 million for her death. So you may remember this incident. Uh, the housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield, died on their property. The Murdoch said she, like a dog, had run by and tripped her, and she fell down some stairs, and it was like cement. It was outside, and she hit her head, and then she ultimately passed from that. The Murdoch said, you know, I'll, we'll take care of the family. 
you know, they have a, a insurance policy and the kids never saw any of that money. And then of course this all came out later that, you know, he was stealing all this money from people. So he, uh, the son testified to say that, yeah, uh, Alec Murdoch took over $4 million from their, that was meant for their family, which, you know, just again, a lot of these financial crimes uh, are crazy. Um, in that vein, the judge has said uh, that financial crime evidence can be, it, it is admissible. Um, so some of these things that we're going to be talking about going forward are going to be detailing Alex's financial crimes. A lot of them, were, well, many of you are probably familiar with, but they did decide that that will be admissible in court. The defense was hoping it would follow this South Carolina law where you know other crimes can't be presented uh, on a trial for a different crime unless, and that's the big part is the unless, it could speak to motive and, you know, that's what the state has been saying all along. The motive for these killings was the amount of debt and all the problems that Alec was running into. So that means a jury will be able to hear that evidence for about these other crimes and see if they believe that that speaks to motive. And with that in mind, uh, on Monday, uh, a CEO testified at the murder trial that Murdoch was in debt uh, and overdrawn at the bank. And they, it, it was in debt or he was in debt over $4 million. So again, that $4 million number comes up. Um, but yes, so that is just another example of what we're going to hear about with how much debt Alec was in the problems he was running into. Uh, so we're definitely seeing that build up. That was really it for the last few days um, those are the big chunks from that, that testimony. Uh, some of it, like I said, um, was prior to the judge ruling that it would be admissible. So sometimes the jury wasn't actually in the room, but now they'll have access to this information as he's ruled. No, this speaks to, this could potentially speak to motive, which is what the prosecution is trying to say. So we'll, we'll see what else comes out and what the jury thinks of it. Some sad news I learned over the weekend. Uh, one of Southern Charm's uh, cast members, Olivia Flowers, she was new this year um, on the C uh, on the uh, most recent season of the show. Uh, I believe she's planning the return for this upcoming season, which is currently uh, had already started filming. Believe it or not, but the the sad news is that her brother Connor Flowers uh, was found dead at the age of 32. Uh, the family didn't really save, uh, share much other information, uh, just that he had passed back on January 30th at his house on the Isle of Palms. As of this recording, uh, no cause of death has been revealed. Uh, the police department is still investigating, so there may be more information, uh, but that's all we know at this, at this time. So obviously thoughts with the Flowers family um, over the loss of Connor. Getting back into the world of politics, uh, former Vice President Mike Pence had to cancel a trip to South Carolina uh, after his daughter uh, went into labor. So he canceled on Monday. He was planning on um, traveling here on Monday, actually, uh, to he was going to meet with some police departments, including here in North Charleston. He was going to meet with Police Chief Reggie Burris and some other law enforcement officials at one o'clock for a roundtable. Supposedly, the focus of the discussion was uh, about renewed calls to defund the police. He was also supposed to attend a meet and greet with you know business leaders, civic leaders, um, and other uh, and members of the Horry County Republican Party in Myrtle Beach. Uh, his organizer said they plan to reschedule as soon as possible. So we'll see if the vice president, if and when he comes back. But uh, as there is speculation that he's running for president, you can certainly expect to see him in the state plenty. As we mentioned, uh, South Carolina, whether it's first in the South or first in the nation, always busy when the election year is coming up. Also recently happening, a Charleston restaurant closed after nearly 40 years of business. Do you know what that restaurant is? Been in Charleston for 40 years and closed. If you guessed Red Lobster, you're a liar and you didn't, but it is Red Lobster. Um, when you see a business, you know, closes in the headline after that long, you're thinking, oh, it must be some mom and pop type operation that's been around. Oh, what is it? Let me think of some of the big ones. And that was Red Lobster. It's a chain. Uh, but 40 years is impressive, chain or not. 
we see turnover in Charleston so much. So, uh, yes, the uh, Red Lobster in West Ashley, you know, the one right up in front of the Citadel Mall uh, by the um, by the highway uh, just off of Sam Rittenberg Boulevard has shuttered. And as I said, 40 years in business. And again, it's a chain. I get it. But that's still impressive to be along to be around that long. Uh, but yeah, even chains aren't surviving here in Charleston. It's rough for restaurants, that's for sure. Some good news in politics. Governor Henry McMaster um, planned on holding a ceremonial signing that would end sub-minimum wage in South Carolina. Uh, this new law would put an end to that. Uh, his plan is to do the signing on today, actually, at the governor's office in Columbia. But this will make South Carolina the third state in the Southeast and 13th in the nation to end subminimal wage. So what is that? We've talked about it in a podcast a long time ago, but this new law is intended to prior- prioritize the stability of individuals with disabilities who are currently subject to subminimum wage by developing a task force to create a two-year transition phase or transition plan rather to phase out subminimal wage by August 1st, 2024. So that means anybody currently working under subminimal wage uh, could then, you know, possibly transition to other types of employment since that will go away. Uh, currently, there are 1,800 people with disabilities who recorded making less than minimum wage through these programs that are currently in place. Uh, so this is a, a piece of legislation that I'm happy to see. You know, it started out probably well intentions. You know, people with disabilities who may not be hired normally could get a job where they're paid less than minimum wage just to give them the opportunity to work and and to build up some skills maybe they didn't have because they haven't been able to work at other jobs. And like I said, it it probably was done with good intentions. Uh, But this puts an end to that practice. Uh, People with disabilities, of course, should be. Uh, have the same rights and equality as anyone else, and now they will in this category. Uh, So no more making less than minimum wage um, by 2024, August 1st, is that deadline by the state. So I'm glad to see that is ending here in South Carolina. And finally, uh, let's go to the sports world. A.J. Green has announced his retirement from the NFL after 12 seasons. He ended his career with the Arizona Cardinals, but he began with the Cincinnati Bengals. If that name sounds familiar, uh, A.J. Green is from South Carolina, and he started to make a name for himself playing high school football in Somerville. Uh, He then went on to the University of Georgia before he was drafted in the first round Uh, in 2001. He was the fourth overall pick to the NFL Cincinnati Bengals. So hats off to A.J. Green. He had a heck of a career. 12 seasons in any capacity is great, but he was one of the best receivers in the league for several of those years he played. Um, So congratulations uh, to the South Carolina native and Somerville High School grad on calling it a career. I am certainly not calling it a career, but I'm going to call this episode. It's done. It's retired. Episode 81, no more. Uh, We got to make room for that sweet, sweet episode 82 tomorrow. That's right. On Wednesday, a little shuffle of the lineup, as I mentioned. I appreciate you all being patient with the episode coming out and for listening. All of you that have subscribed or rated the podcast, reviewed it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. If you haven't done it yet, please do. Uh, That helps this podcast get more ears, um, more eyes over to the website and help people uh, learn about what we do here at Holy City Center, trying to give you the best Charleston news, events, and all that good stuff. Thank you, as I mentioned at the top, to Lindsay Marie Collins with LMC Sound System. And also, I want to say thank you to Tyler Boone. That's his music you hear in each and every episode. You can listen to him on any streaming network. Uh, Until I talk to you tomorrow, good night and good luck.